McKenzie is the new leader of the New Democratic Party of New Brunswick. Our conversation ranged through a wide variety of topics, but all through it, I hope you catch her heart, her wit, and her knowledge. So, welcome. Thank you. Nice um, to be here. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, it's been how many months now as the leader of the NDP? Uh, since August, so three. Okay, and mm -hmm. obviously so far so good. Uh, yeah, it's, we're starting to get a lot of traction and build the party and uh, have some events and the excitement is starting to build, which is really wonderful. Yeah, part of that excitement was just last week, given the timing we're doing this, where there was a false alarm about an election being called. Yeah. The media can drive you nuts, mainstream media, because yeah. I'm thinking, but that wasn't a news story, it was a speculation. Uh, but, yeah, but we but didn't know. I mean, we suspected it wouldn't be a, an election call just because it wasn't a good time for the Liberals to call an election. But yeah. we were holding a meeting anyway, and we tacked on some time to talk about what we would do if uh, if an election was called the next day. And uh, we were surprised by how ready we were, <laughs> you know, and, you know, emotionally ready to go to... Uh, uh, to, to, to start things off, but uh, then the next day we kind of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you've got that lull after. Exactly. Hi, 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 yeah, hi. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But still, we've been busy, you know, we've been having events. We had a grassroots retreat that was really, really exciting. Mm -hmm. And uh, Can you share yeah. highlights of that? Absolutely. We had a day in the church basement, and uh, we invited people from across the province, and they all came. And we talked about, uh, you know, the issues that matter in their writings and looked for common themes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we came up with a whole, whole lot of great ideas and we did a lot of capacity building and uh, everybody came away really, you know, invigorated. That's great. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that New Democrats have that maybe the traditional other two parties don't have is your process by design or by auspices is different. The social democratic process is about a different kind of engagement process. That's right. And yeah. So the the New Democratic Party was started by Tommy Douglas, uh, and it was a bunch of farmers and a bunch of intellectuals who were talking about you know what needed to change because they had a traditional two party system. Yeah. You know his story about the the mice being governed by the white cats and then the black cats and then the white cats, yeah. and uh, you know so they sat down to do something about it and they built an, a party that is based on grassroots democratic process and that's why we're called the Democratic Party because we uh, you know we talk to people we harness ideas we build excitement and we move forward with those ideas and uh, I think New Brunswick is really ready for that that seems to be what we're hearing and uh, you know when we go and talk to people uh, they're looking for a different way of governing and uh, that's what we bring to the table the um it's almost like you should make a meme or let some of your social media young ones go play with uh, white cats, black cats and bring it back and, and let that... <laughs> That's a fun idea because I was uh, telling you earlier, I have uh, all these social groups on my, on my phone and I'm really, really pumped by the way the youth are participating. Mm. And there, uh, you know, when I talked about our grassroots retreats, I had some inspirational speakers come and one of our inspirational speakers was the Democratic Youth Group. Mm. And and uh, they, you know, presented their ideas, and their ideas are really, really big. Mm. And so that got people thinking big, you know. We had mm. to start uh, to uh, to think outside the box and get creative, and uh, and we really did. It was fantastic. Oh, that's that's fun. The, um, that gets, uh, there's so many directions to wander into. So I want to wander into uh, young people and voting, uh -huh. um, their awareness of the, <laughs> the opportunity to go vote, and and be fun to have this show be part of changing the narrative on the next election where the 18 to 25 or 30 year olds actually got engaged and went and voted. Now, one of the key themes un underpinning for the future will be how do we get the 40 percent that don't engage anymore? How yeah. do we get them back so, in the game and, and playing? So for me what's exciting is that the youth are engaging and they're engaging in the process and they're taking a leadership role and you know it's about the youth because they we want them to stay in the province and we want them to build and shape a province where they want to stay yeah. and that's what they're doing in this process and that's what you're going to see when we come out with our platform is that we have some really 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 big ideas and we're drawing on our social democratic roots 
uh, and shaping it to the province uh, mm. uh, and so that it uh, you know fits what we have here and and the resourcefulness and the uh, resilience of the people and and our re natural resources and beauty and we're building uh, a platform that will you know capitalize that and get people excited I really think it will do you have a for instance that you could share oh stay tuned <laughs> okay good because yeah, yeah. you know we have our convention coming up too at the end of November and so we have to respect the democratic process I'm hearing a lot of similar themes uh, throughout the province I'm hearing things that we can fit together to make a really good big picture mm -hmm. and that's kind of my job as a leader yes and uh, when we have our convention we will start to see and everybody will start to shape it uh, you know so that we have yep. uh, a platform that everybody yeah. believes in and everybody around the province can sell uh, when they go door to door. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, one of the pieces that needs to shift in the election narrative is uh, mainstream media will always talk about what and it might be the NDP's wiggle room will be how, like how we bring this all together. Uh, the what mm -hmm. will be, oh we need to improve education, we need to deal with poverty, we need to deal with fitness levels of people. Well, as and, you probably know, I was I was uh, chair of the school board and um, when I started on the school board uh, in Ottawa, it was shrinking and uh, there it was, it was, we, people were demoralized. And so we started to bring some of the NDP way and um, we started to get people excited about how we can, you know, from the grassroots up, rebuild the school board. And uh, you know, I, ta I talk about a little rat pack. We had a little rat pack of what we call end dippers. And uh, we, you know, we started to, to, to rebuild and reshape. And, and, you know, lo and behold, with some positive thinking and some hard work and some, you know, the right kind of approach, uh, so I, I'm a big system thinker, uh, we were able to turn the school board around and start to attract people from all over the world to come and see how we were doing it. And uh, that's the kind of thing that I would really like to, uh, to bring to, to government yeah. and uh, to, uh, you know, turn things around, to get away from the old sort of uh, uh, traditional way of thinking. I sit on the political panel every Thursday and, uh, you know, talking about big oil and talking about... Uh, um, glyphosate and and uh, you know I just I think in pictures and I see you know this picture of oil on the beach and a cloud of glyphosate over the province and and I'd really like to to start to think differently and to start to think more positively and I think that's what the youth bring to the table as well they want to see a province that is somewhere that they can stay and they can build and they can you know reach their full potential yep um, there's several shifts that have occurred in demographic shifts. So um, Richard Florida in his books mm -hmm. on the creative class, mm -hmm. young people are working for different sets of reasons now. Mm -hmm. The old industrial model or the old industrial approach to economy might have had its day. Right. You know? Absolutely. And, and, and you, you know, if you look at how you reform schools, uh, one of the, the, the people who used to come to our, our innovation conferences was Passy Solberg from, from Finland. Okay. And, uh, you know, schools are built based on the industrial model, and uh, we're we're putting out kids who you know are are perfectly attuned to sit in their chairs and 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 listen, and yet the world's not like that anymore. Yep. Uh, you know, you have to be able to be um, flexible and innovative and creative, and you have to teach kids how to how, how to develop those skills so that they, when they get out, they they yep. know what they can do. Yep. And there's so I mean, it's so exciting. It, it's like revolutionary the way that we can uh, yep. uh, start to look at things differently. In some ways, giving it a historical perspective and tying it back to the CCF, mm -hmm. you know, Louis Robichaud was given credit, you know, his party given credit for the Equal Opportunities Act, which was built by a bunch of people from Saskatchewan mm -hmm. that came to New Brunswick at the request of the Premier, saying we have certain challenges that are systemic, we need to rechange our model right. and deliver things. It might be by 2017. Um, we need another version of that process to kick in. It's like 50 years have gone by, now we need a refresher. Oh on, yeah, on absolutely. How, how to do that, you know? Absolutely. So <clears throat> there might be some wiggle room for footing uh, for the New Democrat message that, well, we've done this once before and now it's coming around again, so we need to get at it from this process and creative thinking, critical thinking, and out of the old model in, into a new one. Absolutely, that's uh, exactly the model that I'm 
hoping to hoping bring. Hoping to catch, <laughs> yeah. And I wanted to bring that right to the surface because it has a long shelf life on social media with doing this. And so sometime in June of 2018, in July of 2018, somebody might be watching this interview uh -huh. thinking, they were talking about that like a year ago. You know, because people will only pay attention in a certain moment of time. Oh, yes. Not knowing the conversation's been going on for quite a while. Yeah. That we need a different approach well, to how it, we do things. Well, as we were saying earlier, you know, I've been the leader since August. And yeah. uh, that's, at this time, three months. Yeah. And uh, so we're s figuring out how to build that kind of excitement mm. uh, from the ground up. And so these last three months, that's what I've been doing with my team. And <clears throat> it's people are really receptive to it. We're really getting buy-in. You know, uh, people are really excited about what we can do and the potential we have and what a good fit it is for New Brunswick to have this kind of thinking. Uh, you know, because there's so much potential, so um, much... Uh, there in the people and in the the land and in who we are that we could really uh, do some great things yeah. uh, and uh, we're get you know people get excited once you start to, to have that conversation and so we're we're developing policy for our convention mm -hmm. and it's out of the box thinking mm -hmm. and it's uh, a new way of thinking that's built on who we are yeah, collaboration Collaboration, yeah, yeah, that's a big part of uh, the uh, NDP way of doing things, for sure. Yep. Be interesting <coughs> to have that voice be stronger and uh, get more attention uh, as we move to election a, a year from now. Um, because somewhere out there, there's an audience person thinking, yeah, yeah, but you guys will never win, because that's the traditional... Well, that's... No, no I, I don't mean it as a challenge. I, I want to map out a turf and then let you go play. Um, because that legislature could be a radically different place and the voters could actually get what they think they want because it's one of those weird ironies they say they want this but then they won't change their behavior in order to create that so if the legislature had four or five different voices in it mm -hmm. you know then that would change the dynamic of that space yeah and it would by design it would be more collaborative because it has to be hmm. rather than the traditional conservative and liberal and there's a token one of the other colors it, no, the voters need to change their behavior and pay attention to the range of choices they yeah. have to then put that into the legislature to then say, okay, now you guys work it out. Have you ever seen the video about leadership? Um, Which one? The guy gets up and he's got a, a ghetto blaster. I don't know if they still call them that. <laughs> and he starts dancing, right? And everybody else is sitting around going, oh, you know. And leadership is about the second guy who yeah. stands up. And oh, yeah, it's at a rock concert. Uh, yeah, yeah, a similar one. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so what I'm hearing back now, because it's so clear uh, that, uh, you know, we would never privatize health care like the, the liberals are doing and the conservatives and then the liberals and then they point fingers at each other. Um, but what we're hearing back now is that, oh, well, you know, the NDP's got it right, but they can't win. And that's the liberal message. Sure. And you know that's what getting repeated out there now because they're feeling threatened yeah. and the NDP can win hmm. uh, and in fact uh, you know I'm looking for a majority government thank you <laughs> okay go for it go for it girl but yeah uh, you know and it's got to catch and I think it will and so we're talking now about how to build the excitement that we have inside the party hmm. and how to now start to go out to the next layer hmm. so that uh, people can feel and understand what we're what we are excited about within the party Party. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, I, I do think that they're worried, and I do think we're already changing the conversation uh, that uh, that's being had. And one of the reasons I ran to be the leader of the NDP is because we there's a space, there's a hole that needs to be filled. And if we don't fill it with progressive, socialist, left-leaning thinking, it'll get filled with the opposite. And you know, that's the sort of thing that we're seeing in the states and other jurisdictions. And mm. it's really, really important that these the conversation starts to happen. Mm. And people start to realize that uh, that that progressive politics is actually, the best fit and will build the best future for the province. Especially in this window of time. Especially uh, in this window yeah, of time. A lot it's of exactly the right time. Yeah, a lot yeah. of systems are shifting, breaking down, yes. being reconfigured, yes. and they're looking for leadership, yeah. and they don't know where to see it because the yeah. leadership that's coming so far, whether it's within politics or whether it's in uh, economy or 
they're, they're stuck in an old model. It's yes. like they haven't woke up yet that this has already shifted. It yes. shifted in 2010 That's and 2012. Right. That's right. I mean, some of the debates we've had on the political panel, I've said, you know, look, if we don't change with the times, mm. we're going to be end up in the back of the pack, you know. Mm. Uh, it's... Uh, not yeah. going to be good. And we're talking in general terms, but that's process conversation. And then from that will come some specifics, and then sure. you'll get to, to apply. That's like the drum I want to beat is the voters need to change. So the 40% that don't vote, they need to get more engaged, and they need to pay a bit more attention because the information is all out there now. You can go digging, and you'll find stuff on even the independent candidates because the media won't cover independent candidates. Mm -hmm. So you can have a much richer conversation during an election period and then make up your own mind mm -hmm. rather than having pollsters tell you, well, this is what the outcome's going to be. So like, why even bother going yes. to vote, which is what the traditional parties right. want to play into. That's what they want to play into. And that's yeah. what people have to be careful not to, re you know, reiterate because yeah. uh, that'll play into how people vote, right? There's no point in voting for a third party because it's going to be one of the two main parties. I keep hearing that and like that, that's just wrong. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's a bunch of narratives that need some right. tweaking, so let's go play on election narratives. Sure. Uh, one of them is, oh, you're going to steal their votes from them. And mm -hmm. In my head, I'm thinking, well, 40% of you don't vote, so who are you stealing from whom? Because 60% are, are participating, and they're participating in a traditional way. Mm -hmm. well, one in New Brunswick's uh, long time in narratives is the hand of the grandparent comes out of the grave to tell the young man <laughs> how to vote, right? That stuff goes... So how do we... Say, you know, that day's come and gone now, well, and we're in a new era. We need to sh shift a different way. The good way. news is that, you know, kids today are um, well educated and they are well connected with the outside world, and they know there's a better way of doing things. Yeah. You know, we see what's going on in some of the Scandinavian com countries, yeah. and they, 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 people are happy there. And they, they understand socialism and that uh, it's about helping everybody uh, to move forward together. And uh, that has led to, you know, some really, really great innovative, uh, and it hasn't affected the industry or the business environment at all in a negative way. In fact, they're leading the, the world in, in many innovative ways yeah. uh, with, their, with their industry. And so the, the kids know that. And uh, they know there's a better way. And so the, this generation, I mean, I was in the kitchen with uh, <coughs> one of my neighbors and uh, his grandson came in and uh, the, um, he said to, to his grandson, you know, this is Jennifer, she's the, the NDP, I was a candidate at the time. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, the, the young kid and his boots and his, uh, you know, red plaid jacket, he said, oh, he said, don't worry, he said, I'm voting NDP this time, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, and the, the grandfather went, you know, what? Where'd that come from? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Just paying attention. So the traditional behavior of voters mm -hmm. needs to kind of let go. Um, part of their thinking when they go to vote will be, well, the, it's going to make the legislature dysfunctional. I've never quite understood it, put it that way. So why is it when Canada's had the most progressive policy development, has happened during coalition governments, that there's still that conversation out there that if you've got so many blues and so many reds and so many orange and so many green and so many purple and so many independents, that that won't work. Because in my head, history shows that that will work. And right. that's when the good stuff happens. Well, you know, um, <coughs> universal health care was brought in uh, when Tommy Douglas was the premier. And when he uh, got into the parliament uh, federally, uh, he worked with the Liberal government at the time, and they brought in uh, health care across Canada. Yeah. And so a minority government can work. Yeah. And that's when you have the conversations, and you bring up the issues and the different perspectives on a problem, and you make it work. Yeah. And so, yeah, minority governments can work very well. So wouldn't it be nice if the narrative in the 2018 election is that we need to vote for a minority government with this mix of colors because that's where the changes will occur that we need. And, and it gives some footing for everybody to vote. I'm, yeah. I'm after that. How do we <clears> get the 40 percent to vote? Yeah, Rather the strategic than, oh, message is difficult, right? Because, um, <laughs> you know, people don't say, oh, well, he, we're going to vote in our constituency this way and they're going to vote in that yeah. constituency that way. It's, yeah. uh, you know, it's hard for people to sort of engineer the whole province but uh, yeah. I think it uh, I don't think that that they should feel as though you know it would be a negative thing to have a different kind of uh, yes. representative and in fact once an NDP uh, is elected they are usually very um, 
uh, they, they serve their, their constituency very, very well. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of her name in Quebec. She was down in Vegas at the time. Ruth Ellen Brousseau. Yes. You know, she, she wasn't even there when they elected her. And yeah. then she was such a good constituency person yeah. that uh, they put her back in uh, in the next election. That leads to another theme. Um, voting for the person who's affiliated with the party, uh -huh. but really paying attention to their personal characteristics, you know, uh -huh. meaning you trust them or you like them, uh -huh. you know, um, rather than, oh, you're never going to win, and so I'm going to vote for the party. Right. To win. That's another voter behavior that would be nice to change. Those voters tend to want to trade, here's my vote and what do I get in return, rather than, you know what, I'm going to go with this person this time because I really like them. They, they feel yeah. some sort of emotional connection. That's an interesting thought. I think the, the caveat I would put on that is that um, uh, <coughs> it is important to pay attention to the value system of the party. Uh, you know, if you have a party that's a very um, austerity type uh, party, you could have a really nice, affable, well-meaning uh, local representative. Yeah. But that party, and I, I happen to believe that austerity is not the way to go, might make cuts that would affect, you know, the health care that your child or grandchild might get mm -hmm. uh, down the road. And so I think that the, the important thing is to have an engaged population mm -hmm. and to have an engaged constituency and to make sure that they understand the importance of their vote yeah. and how it might uh, affect not just their lives, but the the whole situation in the province. Yeah, yeah. But this is great because we're gently deepening that whole conversation mm -hmm. about voting, voting patterns. In that dynamic too, becomes so when someone gets elected and if they're in a more entrenched party process, um, they often lose their voice because that's the rest of that continuum. I really like this person. I don't know if I, I agree with all their party's policies, but I want to vote for so and so because I like the person. Then that party ends up being in power and then that person finds their voice cut off uh -huh. because the because that's the rest of what you were explaining is uh -huh. the policies parties might be this even though the individual might have a different take so well, I don't know about a voice getting cut off qu quite frankly well, I think that even in the smallest of minority situations your voice can actually be quite uh, loud um, you know I've just started to sit on the political panel and my one voice, and often I'm the only woman mm -hmm. in a room full of men, which I've you know, gotten used to <laughs> over my life. Uh, yeah. But uh, my voice as a minority, as a woman, as a, you, you know, representing a socialist party, yeah. is, is completely changing the conversation. Yep. And so a minority voice is a very strong voice in many cases, because you're going to be the one who's giving a different perspective to the issue or the problem or the situation that's, uh, that's under examination at the time. I d okay, great, thank you. Yeah. I didn't frame that correctly. Okay. I was after, <laughs> but that's good though, I mean, because we can wander wherever mm -hmm. we want to. I was thinking of the Liberals when they were trying to sell Envy Power. Oh, yes. And there was the MLA from down south. I'm blanking on his name right now. I've got the wrong name in my head, can't get rid of it. Mm. He was kicked out of caucus mm -hmm. because he voted against what, what, the, <coughs> what the team would be. Or I've had, um, there you go, or, or I've had, um, other politicians on and I'll ask them about that dynamic that you have your individual voice representing your constituents and then you've got direction from the party about how you're going to vote. Oh, I see. And, and I just wanted to wander into that space. Well, that's an interesting uh, you know, place to go. Yeah, because that's, that's ongoing. Um, when Matt DeCourcy was on the show as he was a candidate for mm -hmm. the Liberals in the federal election and now he's the uh, MP, he's run into that smack dab. Mm -hmm. and I asked them that as, as personal questions. Said, the day will come if you win, mm -hmm. you're going to be in the House of Commons, your party's going to tell you you're voting yeah. this way, but everybody you live with is going to be telling you you're voting. How are you going to dance that dance? Well, I tell you, <coughs> that is a, a difficult one because uh, you've got your own set of personal beliefs. But in the case of the NDP, hmm. we are a very principled party. Like the, 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 the founders made it very clear who we are and what we stand for. And we're a democratic party, and we, we, we stand for democracy and socialism, which is caring about uh, everybody and not special interests. And so uh, 95, 98, 99 percent of the time, uh, the, the, the NDP will come out with a policy, and I'll go, yep, I'm okay with that, you know. Mm -hmm. And so even though we do whip the vote, w because 
that's really about a group of people deciding what's best for the larger group. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to most of the time be perfectly okay with that. And so I don't think you find a lot of dissension uh, in parties like ours where we know exactly what we stand for. The decisions are made based on a really clear set of values and principles. And so we're all usually okay with the the uh, the decision that's made by the larger group. So that gets into one of the identifiers for the New Democrats. Right. That we do it this way, while the right. other ones do it that way. So if you like how we do it, then maybe you should think about voting for us. Right. And, and then it gets into policy platform and, right. and people. Um, do you have thoughts of, of for the next six months? Mm -hmm. um, what What's the top thing? for you and the party, uh, building membership, grassroots development, but um, can you just walk us through your agenda for the next near future? Well, we've been, you know, building very quickly. Hmm. And so talking uh, almost daily about what the next steps are, how we go and reach out to the next layer. So for the next six months? The next six months. Can you walk through, you know, a rough draft of where you're headed and what the workload looks like for you? Yeah, um, well, up until now, we've been uh, focusing internally, building capacity, building structure, uh, getting ready. And uh, we've had a grassroots retreat, and we're going to have more. And uh, we have a convention, and we're busy planning the convention right now. Where will that be? In Fredericton, okay. at the Fredericton Inn, November the 17th, that weekend. And so we are passing resolutions and, and building our policy and building our capacity and our organization. And that's where our focus is uh, in the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're starting to think and talk about how we uh, get out uh, to outside the party and, and talk to people and, and, and make ourselves relatable. And uh, that's the big conversation, mm -hmm. uh, because once we've got our capacity and our organization and we're all excited about how we are going to move forward, then we've got to get other people excited about us and what we stand for as well. Yeah. And uh, so those conversations will hap happen, and we're already starting to think about how we do that, uh, you know, what kind of mechanisms we use to reach people and uh, how, we, how we proceed. So... Yeah, those are, those are all the conversations, and it's really fun. I'm really <laughs> having a lot of uh, fun with this, uh, especially, as I say, with the, the youth and engaging the youth and uh, just getting people back in, in, uh, into the exciting uh, part of it. Side. The political landscape in New Brunswick um, on a series of issues, mm -hmm. are you able to start to talk? I, I know you need to do your policy work together and right. stuff, but... But are you able to talk about any of the kind of hot button issues that are current in the government? Um, Absolutely. Okay, good. Cause, uh, Let's oh. talk about privatization of health care. <laughs> so, okay, or the Sears thing. Uh, oh, um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So we've been responding, you know, we've been building and focusing our efforts as to where we want to go as a party, but we've also been responding to, uh, to current events. And one of the ones that we're absolutely, uh, totally and completely opposed to is uh, the move towards privatization of health care. Uh, we're the party that, you know, started health care, mm -hmm. uh, public health care, and the moves that we're seeing are completely contrary to the vision that uh, the founders of uh, public health care in Canada uh, had at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a lot of really serious concerns, both about what's happening and the way it is happening, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we have uh, brought to the table. And in fact, we believe that it's uh, contrary to the Canada Health Act and that liberals uh, at the federal level as well as provincially are ignoring some of the uh, guiding principles in the Canada Health Act. And mm -hmm. uh, I wrote a letter to the uh, the new health minister, uh, Jeanette Petipa-Taylor, uh, asking her to investigate that because uh, that's a real concern. Mm -hmm. And I think that what happens when we uh, move responsibility for health care to private hands is that the decisions are made on a, on a rather different set of criteria and they will be financially uh, based decisions as opposed to a public system mm -hmm. which is looking out for the interests of the people. Yeah. And that's why we have public educa public uh, health care and public education. Yeah. But uh, it's so that you have it publicly administered so that people don't get lost 
and some of the people who are least well served when you start to look at things purely on a financial basis are seniors, mm. are the rural folk because you have to travel further to get to them, yep. and uh, the people who are um, poor, financially challenged, because their needs are more complex and more difficult to serve as well. And so, you know, these are really, this is a really serious move that uh, that this government is making. And I think we're starting to see some of the, some of the things I'm talking about come through in the ambulance service as it had been privatized. And as we start to move more and more that way, I think we're going to see more and more direct impact on the people of New Brunswick based on these decisions and uh, I think we have to get people you know revved up about that because it mm -hmm. will affect us it'll affect our neighbors our mm -hmm. sisters our brothers our kids our grandkids mm -hmm. and the way you say it it's not like you're just trying to ring an alarm oh no no it's something deeper than it's that. a serious concern yeah serious the um and we're speaking about the the move to Medivy Blue Cross yes. as the administration element exactly. to healthcare delivery. Exactly. Um, tied to all of that is another narrative that would be fun if you played with a little bit, because maybe the belief behind that kind of move is right. that government should run like a business. Right. And what you just mapped out as your answer right. to all that is that no, no, government is responsible for the care and well-being of exactly. a population, which is very different exactly. from running and a business. Exactly, and I brought that up in the political panel. You know, the number one priority that's on all the reports that we were looking at was more jobs, and uh, I said, well, where is it in the in the priority list? The well-being of New Brunswickers, hmm. you know, because that's what uh, a public administration is supposed to be looking out for. Mm. We're supposed to be making sure that uh, that, that uh, the, pe the people are well served. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, that this, this narrative that we need to be more like a business, we need to be very efficient, uh, as I said earlier, the people who get hurt by that mm. are the seniors, the rural folk, the, the people who have limited means. Yeah. And uh, I think as a society, I don't think that's where we want to go. I think that New Brunswickers values don't match with those values. We do care about people and we do care about our neighbors and we do care about other New Brunswickers. Yeah. And, uh, and, and uh, I think that's the, the message that we have to, uh, to really focus on is to make sure that, uh, that people realize that their governments are not serving them well. They're serving them very badly at the moment. Yeah. And, and part of what will follow from that position you just mapped out is that all typical of NDP, they'll, they'll run like big deficits. Because the logic seems to be run more like a business, become more efficient, get out of debt and deficit. Lost in there, and it, for me it's the Atlantic Institute of Market Studies. They, yeah. they, they actually <laughs> drive me mean. a bit bonkers, you know, <clears throat> because they do these correlations that you can correlate anything. Yeah. So it doesn't mean anything when they do their correlations of ratio of uh, civil servants to oh, yeah. uh, citizens and debt ratios. Because the mandate for a government is to provide a school in that community, whether the school's got 500 students in it or if it's got 300 students in it. There is a tipping point, but there's an obligation to provide a service to create an equity, which goes back to the Equal Opportunities Act mm -hmm. in the 66. Mm -hmm. But you're responsible for population. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's balances in there for creating you know, more effective services, right. but it's gotten skewed. Because right. if we applied the same principles towards business, and why mm -hmm. business always needs government dollars in order to get going. Mm -hmm. I asked this of several guests, and, and it comes up differently from each of them. Uh, the, the startups say, we need the government money to get started, which makes perfect sense. What doesn't make sense is the established industry mm -hmm. needing money in order to sustain itself when it's got all of its own resources to do that. Mm -hmm. So there's a principle that needs to evolve. Right. So I'm going to go back to the first thing you said. <laughs> Good. <laughs> People think of socialist governments as, uh, you know, running up deficits. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, the, most of the, the, the studies that have been done show that, in fact, the NDP governments have been some of the most fiscally responsible governments uh, that, uh, that Canada's had. Manitoba for the longest time. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, I'm not opposed to deficit spending. I think there's a time and a place for it. And, uh, and uh, however, what I think, what I have seen 
that we bring to the table is, is very principled decision making that in fact makes the government more efficient just by its very nature because you know the types of decisions you're going to make. You're not going to come along and reverse them. Uh, you know what the uh, the liberals and the conservatives have done and it's gone, well I'm just going to reverse that because you know it was brought in by the liberals and we can't have that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's very expensive. Changing your mind is very <laughs> expensive. It's expensive in a financial sense but it's also expensive in the fact that you're not progressing yes. quickly. You're going taking one step forward and two steps back. Yes. And so the NDP, I think, brings principled decision making. Not that we're, you know, going to make decisions without consulting people. That's part of part of who we are. Mm -hmm. But doing a lot of that upfront work actually makes government more efficient, more effective, and moves us forward more quickly. That also ties to another principle about if you create a healthy environment, then business will come. Yes. Rather than how do we subsidize business? Oh with, yes. With tax yeah. You know, I mean, the whole approach to building the economy well, is yeah. just completely backwards and upside down. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying not to use yeah. words. <laughs> oh, you can let it rip. That's good. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah, because that's where it needs to go. It, yeah. it needs that heart, that yeah. passion. It's yeah. like we got to stop doing it the way we've been doing it. Exactly. But yeah. Part of the question then is, well, what does the new version look like? I know, and that's what we're talking about, and that's what's so exciting. Mm. Uh, I talked about all the, the different groups I have going on my phone, but we're starting to talk about a new way of looking at business development and, and attracting the right kinds of uh, uh, businesses to, to, to grow here and to move here and how do we go from you know getting them here and how do we then grow to um, uh, letting them grow and expand and, yeah. uh, and so we've that. had a lot of talks about that and you know that's what NDPers do really well as we get yeah. excited about uh, ideas and concepts and how to do that. Um, your comments remind me of a past interview with Niels Riemann who is a medical cannabis expert oh, yes. on the scientific side. Mm -hmm. But half of his conversation was about a collaborative approach to business. Mm -hmm. So what's frustrating him is the amount of secrecy mm -hmm. rather than transparency. Cause he see, but he's coming from a different culture, so there's that. And, and it's like if we would all, you do this bit, you do this bit, you do this bit. And if we had some political leadership that brought that all together, right. then everybody would take off. Right. Rather than, I'm not telling you what I'm doing, and you're not telling me what we're doing. So on Saturday, we sat around in a friend's living room, and it was a policy development uh, about how to uh, do rural, um, uh, yeah. you know, reinvigorate rural the, the development. rural development. Yeah. And uh, those are the conversations we had. Yeah. And uh, so that's what will go to convention, and then those will, those ideas will be built on and expanded on mm -hmm. and maybe made a little more realistic, and, and that will go, uh, you know, as part of our policy going mm -hmm. forward. But that's the kind of thing that the NDP really does well mm -hmm. and that's the kind of thing that Tommy Douglas did and that's the kind of thing that we would bring you know forward and make it more modern and more effective my background I'm a high-tech uh, entrepreneur and so uh, you know that they, they kind of have to rein me in a bit like I'm a real <laughs> <laughs> ideas person I love that creative front end yeah. that's my you know that that's, that's where playground. I get really <laughs> Fine. But uh, yeah, and so bringing some of that and, and having that creative front end to our processes, yeah. that's what I bring to the table. Uh, and uh, you know, I think it's get, it, the, the excitement is contagious. Well, New Brunswick has built some interesting pieces. Absolutely. And, and that's very There's much so that's one much of those pieces. Here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, to, uh, to try to capture what we can in, in the hour, and thank you for, for all the time, um, farming, food, yes. food security. Yes. Thoughts? That's what we were talking about on Saturday afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a huge untapped potential for this province uh, is to, uh, to, to invest in agriculture, family farms. We were talking about small farms. We were talking about medium size, large scale, you know, what it is that we would do, how we would build that, both, you know, uh, thinking about it as an, a silo, but also thinking about the other things that we have to bring in and uh, yeah. and coordinate, and how what role government can play uh, there. And so those are those that I'm hoping that that will be a big topic of conversation at our convention. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's been a challenge with doing the show to get food and farming uh, attraction um, with uh, other people. They'll take, oh, oh yeah, oh, we well. need to do food security. <laughs> and another thinking, hour. <laughs> yeah. Because it, sh it used to be one of our three identifiers. Yeah. I had a friend once teach me, you know, Dennis from New Brunswick's founded on three F's, forestry, fishing, and farming. 
We talk about forestry and fishing and fair amount. Farming's disappeared yeah. off the map in terms of yeah. the provincial narrative, yeah. especially at election time. Yeah. And yet it it's us. Yeah. It's it grounds us in so many different yeah. ways. And the potential with all of the amount of climate change that's going on, all the demographic shifts going on. Yeah. It strikes me whenever I read media or watch on television there's still no conversation that puts farming right in the top three or four oh, yeah. of the strategies we need to do to get New Brunswick out of oh, its yeah. funk and get our yeah. economy going again. Yeah. Well, I live in a little fishing village and uh, I, you know, I have my own patch uh, where I grow my own food and I really like to um, uh, feed myself and, and my family within sort of a 10 kilometer radius of, of, of my house and I know that we can do that. I know that we can do that here. We can supply our own needs uh, you know, to a much greater extent, and and improve our food food security. Yeah. And again, that's that you know you would have loved the conversation yeah. on Saturday because that's exactly what we were talking about. Yeah, you know, you, how do we do that? How do we, you know, support the farmers, support the young people who want to farm, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, make sure that they they you know are are put out there with a solid business case and a solid plan, yeah. uh, so that they they stand a really high chance of success. And uh, y there is a lot of innovation out there, and government's role is to facilitate and to make sure that uh, you know the missing pieces are are there, mm -hmm. and uh, that's uh, you know that's that's kind of our bread and butter, so yeah. to speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would be, yes, it would be nice if if uh, in the next election there was um, uh, part of the narrative from the public was that we want to have political leadership so that we're. 80% of our food supplies exactly. from outside, and then it's 70% from outside, so, yeah. so we're slowly f learning yeah. how to feed ourselves again, yeah. so that 20 years from now, we've turned the corner and we're okay. Yeah. That gets into another thing about... One the of my neighbors uh, has chickens that lays blue and green eggs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, um, we could market that. Yeah. <laughs> To shift, because another piece of the narrative that needs some nurturing is people expect change to come very quickly. Uh -huh. And some pieces are going to take 10 years, 15 years, which gets into political parties changing. And you mentioned the cost, you know, so the red team leaves, the blue team comes in, uh -huh. we step backwards two years uh -huh. while they figure out their policies. Uh -huh. How do we get it so that there's some things that are untouchable based on political party? that mm. if it takes 25 years for a cohort to go through an education system and have physical education and, and attack or address their obesity rates and better quality of food in the schools so that that addresses it, uh, can we leave something alone for 20 or 25 years or that it's untouchable based on that rotation of different parties coming into power and we can't do that because that's what those guys did. We need to do it this way. Any thoughts about, because that's a long running issue since, you know, after Mr. Hatfield left. Mm -hmm. And and so somewhere in the late 80s to current times, part of our dysfunction is we can't move forward because we keep flip, 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 uh, flip. I think flip. that's a kind of a dangerous path to go down. I think to say something is untouchable, then, I mean, you always have to sort of, I'm a mathematician, so you have to sort of think in the limit. And what would happen if you know, some dark force came in and put okay. something in and then they made that, you know, untouchable and then, you know, the population is okay. is stuck with that in perpetuity. I think what you have to do is you have to do the right things and you have to engage the population and get buy-in to what you're doing and then through the democratic process that becomes untouchable. So okay. I come in, I, you know, re invent the way we do we do teaching and schooling yep. and learning yep. and people get excited about that and uh, then someone would, might come in and say no no we're going to go back to the sort of the sage on the stage you know sit in your chair for hours at a time kind of model mm. then people are going to say no you know we like this new exciting innovative way of learning okay. uh, where you know the kids are coming out really really well mm. and uh, uh, you know, we like it, and then it becomes untouchable, right? Yeah. Then so, you can't so have another sort of very institutional kind of government, you know, we have to go back to basics yeah. uh, kind of style, and uh, uh, that's the way I think you do it. That's the way you get uh, the longevity out of things. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I had in the back of my head the Scrabble report from when there was so much change in curriculum design during the liberal era that the teachers on the delivery end didn't know which way it was up. Right. A and so that really That's a real danger. Yeah. yeah. So how do you stabilize that? Well, thing? that was one of the things I learned on the school board was how to get buy-in. 
so that uh, you know, it's it's not easy because people have been doing things a certain way for a long time. And you can't just come in and say, thou shalt do this now from now on. They have to believe in what they're doing. Yeah. And so there, that's a whole process. Uh, that's, a, you know, a process of engagement. And, you know, it, it does take time. Yeah. And uh, But it is it is really important because it's a two-way process, right? Yeah. The people who work on the front lines are the ones who know the system the best, and they know what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. And so you might think you have the greatest idea, <laughs> but uh, it has to be tailored to the reality that's yeah. on the ground. And uh, one of the side effects of doing it that way is that people feel empowered and, uh, you know, it's like distributed leadership. They, people, you know, feel listened to yeah. and uh, their voices are heard and they can effect, effect change. And that's a very exciting process, yeah. you know, when you start to see people feel like their voices matter and that they can, they can say and do and raise issues and mm -hmm. that will actually change the way the system works. Mm -hmm. then, then you start to move. Like then things yep. really start to happen. Great. And that's a really exciting time. That's a great explanation. Mm -hmm. Because we could pick uh, several different examples, mm -hmm. but that process is it, it's a huge process. Exactly. Yeah. What, so it yeah. can apply in different, uh, yeah. different audiences, mm -hmm. different ways. Um, last theme maybe to explore is uh, in that narrative for elections is um, trust, trusting politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, so media will tend to frame up the conversation as about policy issues. Um, so there's this platform piece, this platform yes. piece. They put them against each other. Here's all our policies. 80% of people vote based on what your photo look like. And and the, the policy stuff is like way in the back somewhere. Mm -hmm. And yet it does count. I'm not mm -hmm. saying things don't count. But mm -hmm. people are emotional mm -hmm. beings. They make decisions emotionally. Mm -hmm. And in behind that is this narrative of distrust of the political process mm -hmm. of politicians. Um, media in general tend to feed a conflict model, mm -hmm. you know, good or bad, exactly. us and them, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not. We're all mm -hmm. on the same team, believe mm -hmm. it or not, right? We just don't nurture that conversation. Mm -hmm. So, and that might be why 40% of the people don't vote, because they just don't trust the process, they don't trust the outcome, they, don't, they just don't engage anymore. So, do you have any thoughts? I might be wandering into an odd place. But well, that, that theme of public trust, of politicians and public leadership, would be nice if that comes back. Yeah. One of the, the, the negative experiences of being in politics is when you go to someone's door and you knock on their door and they answer the door and they say, oh, you're a politician, you know, I, you're not trustworthy, I'm not going to talk to you, slam. And that's really hard because I almost always keep my word. And if I promise something, I deliver it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, or if for whatever reason I don't, I'll give a, a thorough explanation. But most of the time it's well thought through and, 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 uh, and we can implement it. And so that's my track record. And so the trust issue, um, I, you know, you have to connect with people at an emotional level. Yeah. You have to... Um, uh, be with them where they are but uh, at the end of the day you know it is important to have trust and it is important to have uh, politicians with integrity and it is important to uh, get to know your politician not just your politician but the the political process and who they are and what they stand for because that at the end of the day will lead to a better life <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, that was great. <laughs> it's one of those, and thank you for offering that, that's what I mean, because it's coming from your heart, and it, that counts, you know? Mm. And often um, politicians are put in a box just by virtue of putting their name on a ballot and say, yes, I'll run for public office. We've lost uh, the respect for public office, whether it's civil service or um, politicians. I mean, in a general narrative term. I find it amazing what people put up with you know, in terms of behavior from their politicians. Uh, uh, I, watching the political panel before I became the leader and seeing them, oh, it's his fault, you know, I know yeah. it's bad, but it's his fault. And, oh, no, no, it was your fault. And when you were in power, you did this. Schoolyard. And, uh, I, and, and I hate to say something bad about schoolyard. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Put schoolyard <laughs> to, yeah, to shame. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, there were surveys done 10, 15 yeah. years ago, the least trusted professions, you know, and... Yeah. and funny headline was, you know, ta-da, politicians beat out used car dealers yeah. you know, for the least trusted yeah. uh, profession. 
That's that's a reflection on the public narrative about an uh, institution and a process. It's key to everything we do because it's yeah. at the center of everything we do. Yeah. So it's so that narrative needs important. to change. It is. You know? Yeah. So you've demonstrated well, like why I'm people doing what I can. <laughs> trust you. Yes. And it boils down to one on one. <clears throat> people have to make yes, their own exactly. decision. Exactly. Exactly. And, yeah. and get through all the smoke and mirrors and the promises and all that stuff. Well, in the spin, and uh, it's really important that people cut through that mm -hmm. uh, because uh, that is out there. Uh, we talked about uh, people saying, "Oh, well, you know, don't pay any attention to the NDP; they can never get elected." That's liberal spin. That's spin from other parties. That uh, yeah. you know, people need to be more confident in their own ability to make up their own mind mm -hmm. uh, and to do the the, the background research to. Uh, to decide what it is they want in terms of uh, a government that will uh, make the big changes that they want, or at least, in some cases, stop the changes that they don't want. Yes. You know, <laughs> that's huge. That's another theme, like voting for something instead of against something. Yeah, well, look at the government's track record, and do you like what they've done, you know? Uh, is it okay that uh, they're privatizing uh, the extramural program? Is it okay that our ambulance service is uh, not serving our rural populations? Is it okay mm -hmm. that we're spraying forests with glyphosate? You know, these are the questions that, uh, that people need to ask themselves when they go to vote and uh, do the research and, and see you know, because I've been in and talked to um, school kids and, and talked to classrooms and they say, well, what's on your platform? Well, I'll tell them this is what's on our platform. But it's also important to look at track records and, you know, basic fundamental principles and values. Those are those are key as well mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, people have to, to deliver what they promise. You can't just go and look like you're a progressive government and then get in and act like you're not. Yeah. That's, uh, that's important too. Yeah, that gets back to the trust element. You know? mm -hmm, I'll exactly. say what I need to say to get elected, and as soon as I'm elected, I'm going to go do what I want to do. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of minutes left. How would you like to send us out? Final oh, thoughts. Oh my goodness. Uh, Something well, that you came that you knew you wanted to get out, <laughs> and, we, and we didn't get there because we wandered all over. You know. No, uh, I think you've asked some really great questions. I I do. Uh, feel and talking to people and getting out and talking to New Brunswickers that uh, the types of uh, policies and platforms and ideas that the NDP represents are the it's the right time for that now so that uh, we can take this uh, this province and and use the skills and s use the resourcefulness and use the resilience uh, that we have uh, in our people to take and make this province, you know, a really wonderful place where the youth want to stay, want to build their lives, want to raise a family, and uh, we need to provide the environment for them to do that. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of issues and problems and things that we can solve, but that's what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Being a happy place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> they call me sunshine in the office, but <clears throat> yeah, it's having, it, it is a mind frame. It's having a positive outlook and, uh, and then showing people how you can build on that and, and how that's contagious. Uh, you know, there's always going to be problems and you always have to deal with them properly and effectively and completely. However, you can't let that take you off course and where you're headed and where things, uh, things are going because uh, that's what matters. Thank you for this. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. And thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. And love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Mm -hmm.